Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank you for the kind invitation to London. It is a great honor for me and a premier as well because I always hesitated to accept invitations to your country. As you may imagine, it is difficult for a philosopher who has to consider the proper meaning of words to express himself in a language he cannot use fluently. But the invitation to this Congress was simply too tempting. So the fat's on the fire, and we have to make the best out of it. I hope you can ignore the mistakes I will make in my speech, and I apologize deeply for my doubtlessly bad English. Well, a few months ago, the Bishop of Regensburg in Bavaria, Dr. Gerhard Müller, celebrated a high mass in which he fought a sharp attack against Richard Dawkins and me. He did not only criticize our disrespectful handling of religious concepts, he also preached that our evolutionary approach would lead to a new rise of social Darwinism. Let me quote the bishop in his own words. Why infanticide, abortion, and therapeutic cloning should be forbidden? Following the example of mountain gorillas, which kill some of their young, the question is asked, why shouldn't humans do the same? What is reprehensible in that if nature, um, natural instinct drives us to do so? When the faith in God gets lost, there will be no respect for human life. That is what we have experienced during the two German dictatorships. Where God is disclaimed, there is no right to live, no right for self-determination. Then all the values get lost on which our God-orientated but also humanitarian culture is built. Miller's sermon was widely spread by the Catholic press service, Cutnet. It was well received by many believers and sadly, not only by them, because Miller's preaching was based on an argument which is quite popular today, especially in Germany. After realizing that it's not possible to challenge the theory of evolution as a scientific explanatory model, Darwin's opponents concentrate on the moral argument against evolution. They don't disclaim the fact of evolution anymore in Germany. That means the transformation of species through the ages, but they do deny any consequences of the theory of evolution, uh, evolution concerning our general worldview. The moral argument against evolution claims that a stronger consideration of the theory of evolution would destroy not only the faith in God, but also the basic principles of humanity. Well, I think the first part of the argument is true. If you really understand the modern theory of evolution, you cannot believe in a loving creator who designed the world around us. Nature is so unintelligently designed in so many cases that the imagination of an intelligent designer becomes quite a stupid idea. By the way, the strange concept of an intelligent designer who created the world is not only basic for the American intelligent design movement. On closer consideration, we have to admit that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in general need such an illusion because without it, their beliefs would collapse like a house of cards. So, for fun's sake, let us assume for a little moment that an omnipotent God had really created the universe in order for humans to live in it and to be able to follow his plan of salvation. Under such circumstances, how on earth could we explain that this hyper-intelligent designer at first, A, created countless dinosaurs, later B, had an enormous chunk of stone crash into their home planet so that C, the dinosaurs became extinct in order to D, create space 
for a few tiny animals from which the supposed culmination of creation, Homo sapiens, evolved millions of years later. How intelligent, if I may ask, can a designer be who displays such a grotesque way of working? No graphic arts agency, no car manufacturer, no fashion company, no person halfway in his right mind would employ a designer with such a disastrous cost-benefit balance. So, if we want to or not, we have to make a decision. Evolution or creation, Darwin's on the origin of species or the Bible, scientific evidence or religious faith. All attempts to combine the one side with the other have failed. And that's not astonishing, I think. You also cannot be just a little bit pregnant, can you? Well, we can take note. The first part of the moral argument against evolution indeed has its justification. But that doesn't frighten people much nowadays. In Germany, for example, the big majority does not believe in a personal God anymore. So Darwin's opponents, like Bishop Müller, have to bring the big guns in. And they do so with the second part of their argument in claiming the theory of evolution would destroy the basic principles of humanity. Of course, this argument is wrong. But at first sight, there seems to be some historical evidence. Unfortunately, big ideas invite to big abuse. And Darwin's dangerous idea was no exception to the rule. Not only politicians and philosophers, but also evolutionary biologists advocated social Darwinism, racism, and eugenics. Social Darwinists misunderstood Darwin's concept, survival of the fittest, as an instruction to build corresponding social conditions, keyword, law of the jungle. Evolutionary biologists like the German Ernst Hecke constructed racist step letters from the so-called low savage to the highly civilized people. Also, the idea that the government has to act as a strict breeder to prevent genetical decay was very popular at the first half of the 20th century, not only in Nazi Germany. We all know about the, the uh, horrible consequences of these ideologies, no one should try to whitewash these facts. But do these historical references really confirm the moral argument against evolution? Surely not. Two main reasons are opposed to this moral argumentation. First reason, <coughs> The theoretical concepts on which social Darwinism, racism, and eugenics were based upon have already been disproved. Social Darwinists, for example, disregarded that self-interest in nature produces not only the ruthless thrust to enforce one's own interest at the cost of others, but also cooperation, solidarity, and empathy. Racists failed to recognize the big similarities of all humans living today, which caused biologists to meanwhile abandon the term race concerning homo sapiens. Advocates for eugenics, on the other hand, assumed that we are only puppet, puppets of our genes, but this genetical determinism was wrong because it ignored the strong influences of cultural factors for human behavior. In short, the theoretical biologism is scientifically dead, and with it, the normative biologism, such as social Darwinism, racism, and eugenics, have lost their breeding grounds. The second reason against the moral argumentation is even more important. A scientific explanation of a given behavior should not be misunderstood 
as its ethical justification. Evolutionary biologists try to find out why we encounter infanticide, rape, group conflicts, and so on, all too frequently in nature. That certainly does not mean that they want to elevate these behavior patterns by turning them into ethical roots. Quite the opposite. Especially evolutionary thinkers should be immune to committing a naturalistic fallacy because they should know which catastrophes we would evoke should we derive our ethical values non-reflective non from nature. In this context, we have to understand that the theory of evolution is no Weltanschauung, no ideology, no confession. The theory of evolution does not prescribe how the world should be. It rather describes how the world is and explains why it is, how it is. That's why the moral argument against evolution must fail. On principle, the theory of evolution is beyond good and evil. It does not tell us what we should do. How we may cope with the empirical findings of evolutionary scientists cannot be derived from the theory of evolution itself. That is a matter of philosophical, ethical reflection. This leads us to another important point. The theory of evolution is not another Weltanschauung on the market of confessions, but it is a kind of litmus test for the truth content of all the worldviews we find on that market. In this sense, the theory of evolution has wide-reaching consequences concerning our worldview, because most known ideologies, especially the so-called high religions, have no chance to survive Darwin's test of truth. So we should say it loud and clear, 150 years after the publication of On the Origin of Species, the date of expiry for religious beliefs is definitely exceeded. As we all know, the fact that the date of expiry has passed does not prevent millions of people to consume the rancid products of faith. <laughs> Why? Because most people do not know that there are meaningful alternatives to the expired religious merchandises. It's simply not enough to prove that religious faiths are incompatible with scientific expl explanations. In fact, we have to demonstrate that here and now there are better ways to find the meaning of life. In a similar way, it's not enough to falsify the moral argument against evolution and to prove that the theory of evolution certainly does not destroy the basic principles of humanity. We instead have to demonstrate to a greater degree that an evolutionary philosophy can make a significant contribution to the unfinished project of humanity. Therefore, the theory of evolution must be combined with a modern humanist philosophy. 50 years ago, Julian Huxley already undertook such a composition. Huxley was, as you surely know, a very remarkable person in many different ways. On the one hand, he was a very important biologist, co-founder of the modern evolutionary synthesis and mastermind of recent ethology. On the other hand, he was an also important humanist activist, the first director of the UNESCO, president of the British Humanist Association, and chairman of the founding congress of the International Humanist and Ethical Union. In Julian Huxley's life, two streams came together that many contemporary philosophers and journalists <laughs> consider being contradictory, humanism and naturalism. 
In fact, after the publication of my own manifesto for an evolutionary humanism, which stands in Huxley's tradition, I received reviews stating that I were not a humanist, but an animalist. Some contem contemporary philosophers simply cannot understand that it's possible to combine a humanist philosophy with a naturalistic image of humanity. In order to understand Huxley's synthesis, it may be helpful to demonstrate it in a graphic. The graphic shows the set of naturalism on the left side and the set of humanism on the right. In the intersection, we find Huxley's synthesis called evolutionary humanism. On the left side, beyond the intersection, we find the set of anti-humanistic naturalism. That includes all kinds of naturalism that are not compatible with humanistic convictions, for example, cynicism and social Darwinism. On the right side, also beyond the intersection, we see the set of anti-naturalistic humanism. Here we find all kinds of humanism that are contradictory to a naturalistic worldview. Not only do religious forms of humanism belong to this set, but also secular humanistic conceptions that are based on a supranaturalistic image of humanity. For instance, the widespread belief that our mind could act or react independently from neuronal processes. In the last five years, the Giordano Bruno Foundation in Germany adopted Huxley's concept of evolutionary humanism in a modified shape, and we have been making very good experiences with that. On the one hand, evolutionary humanism allows a strong scientific approach which nowadays is, is attractive for all those people who are seeking a rational unity of knowledge and who won't let themselves be fooled by religion or ideology. On the other hand, evolutionary humanism seems to give the right answer to all moral argumentations against evolution. It demonstrates that science and humanism can walk hand in hand but there is no contradiction between, between evolutionary thought and the battle for human rights. Compared to the theory of evolution itself, evolutionary humanism is a Weltanschauung. But of course, it's no religion. It's an alternative to religion. Evolutionary humanists don't believe in holy dogmas or absolute truths. They trust the principle of critical testing and try to let wrong ideas die before people die for wrong ideas. With the concept of evolutionary humanism in the background, the Giordano Bruno Foundation managed to gain an astonishing influence on social and scientific debates in Germany in the past years. We promoted the discussion about critical rationalism, brain research, and evolutionary theory in the sciences as well as in the media. We supported the Council of Ex-Muslims as well as many activities of the so-called new atheism or the criticism of religion in general. We were engaged in the fight for human rights against xenophobia or religious intolerance. So after only five years of existence, the Giordano Bruno Foundation is, unexpectedly, certainly the best known secular institution in Germany. I think the main reason for this development is the fact that we adopted Huxley's synthesis of naturalism and humanism. This approach was quite new for the secular movement in Germany, which was traditionally much more inspired by Feuerbach, Marx, Nietzsche, or Freud. Of course, we also refer to these secular thinkers, but I have to admit, our success as foundation is essentially based on British imports. And so I'm glad to be here because I want to say thank you for all the inspirations we have received from Britain and from the British thinkers, 
mainly from Charles Darwin, Julian Huxley, and Richard Dawkins. Thank you very much. After, after having said that, you may understand why the title of this Congress was so tempting to me that I forgot all my inhibitions to speak in a foreign language. In my opinion, Darwin, Humanism and Science is a good formula for a modern secular movement. I think an advanced humanistic philosophy should certainly have an evolutionary approach. On the other hand, the theory of evolution needs a humanistic interpretation in order to avoid the barbarisms of the past. It is easy, very easy, to become a cynic if you study nature or human culture. But as humanists, we have to withstand this temptation. We have to hold on to the rational belief that Homo sapiens has the potential to be an extraordinarily friendly, smart, creative, and funny animal. Let us promote the conditions under which mankind can develop these positive potentials. Otherwise, the history of humanity will continue to go on as a history of inhumanity. As humanists, we have good reasons to celebrate the fact of evolution because it means that everything is constantly changing and that is a source of hope. That was one reason for the Giordano Bruno Foundation to launch a campaign this year with the objective of converting Ascension Day into Evolution Day. <laughs> for this campaign, which was well received by the German public, we produced a song called Children of Evolution. <laughs> Coming to the end of my presentation, I would now like to show you an extract of the video club we made. Huh? A little louder. Darwin as a rock star. <laughs> Thank you very much for your kind attention.